So, today's guest speaker is a, is a program that's pretty near and dear to me. I, I used to be on the board of this uh, organization at one point in time. Uh, in my prior life, I'm a, I always tell people I'm a recovering child welfare worker uh, myself. So I spent 16 years in the trenches doing child welfare work. Uh, ended my capacity as the regional manager for all child welfare and adult protective services here in the western part of Kentucky from uh, the Ohio River to the Tennessee border in 17 counties. So uh, the work that this organization does um, is very, very impactful on a day-to-day -day basis and really shapes uh, the lives, particularly the children that are involved in the child welfare system. So today I want to introduce Casa of the Ohio Valley, their executive director and their staff here, Rosemary Condor. Um, Rosemary is a lifelong resident of Davis County. She's had a diverse career in critical care as a critical care registered nurse, a certified diabetes educator, a pharmacy, hair salon, gift store, and coffee shop owner, a property developer, and Mimi to 18 grandbabies, most important. Since 2015, she joined a team at CASA of Ohio Valley as executive director. She's married to city commissioner and all around great guy, Larry Condor. I can attest to that. They're a proud uh, handler and owner of Watson, of Casa the Ohio Valley Therapy Pub. And I will now turn this over to Rosemary and her staff to share a little bit more about uh, Casa the Ohio Valley. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I, you know, this is wonderful to look out and already see familiar faces that are familiar with Casa because we've done some great collaborative work together, I think, in the community over the last few years. And, and we, uh, what I love about Owensboro and being a resident here was that we always have such a great community. Whenever there's a need, we put the word out and somebody steps forward. And I think that we see that within so much support within our nonprofits with each other and, and the community as a whole. So I applaud you for what you do for your individual organizations and for the community as a whole. Because as Brandon said, you know, I have 18 grandchildren, so this is a little bit of a selfish motivation for me. This is their future that we're working on here today. So whenever we talk about um, Owensboro Regional Recovery and the, the men that they serve, that directly impacts the children that CASA serves. So we are all connected to each other. So that I think that that, for me, has been the biggest eye-opener in stepping <coughs> up. And having a diverse background in, in uh, work means that I'm old. So I've seen a lot of things happen. I've seen a lot of change in our community. And overall, I think it's been tremendously positive. I think. Um, we have brought a lot of problems to light, and we we want to learn and want to know more about what's happening in our community. And I think that is the catalyst for change. When you make people aware of an issue, then then they get the opportunity to learn more and change. And that's that's one of the great things about CASA. We have been in Davis County for over 20 years, and it was kind of like a really great kept secret because we're court appointed special advocates. When I was introduced to the job, uh, I wasn't sure if it was a Hispanic ministry, you know, for a CASA kind of thing. I didn't know it was an acronym for Court Appointed Special Advocates. And because they work so closely in the court system, they're not so much out in the community. Our children are victims of crime, so we can't use them as poster children. We can't go around and tell you this little Johnny is a CASA child. So we, it was kind of a, a quiet secret. But our mission is to recruit adult volunteers and we train them by using the standards of National CASA to become advocates, a voice for the child that is caught up in the court system through no fault of their own. And that and those, these volunteers are just incredible people who give their heart to these kids. So that's that's our basic mission. But beyond that mission, we have a duty to help create awareness and collaboration within the community so that we can help break the cycle of abuse and neglect. So we need to let people know what abuse and neglect look like so that you can be aware of it, so that you can report it, so that you can intervene or hopefully prevent it. Because child abuse is 100% preventable. If we just are more aware of what, what causes it, what, um, what issues. So when we, I talk about CASA, I kind of get caught up in talking about other circumstances that create the abuse. When you look at the problem of child abuse and neglect in Davis County last year, 700 substantiated cases. That's beyond 1,000 reported that's substantiated. That means that these kids have had enough incidents in their life that 
social services says we have to intervene. Now hundreds of those go into the court system because the court has to intervene and try to help mom and dad get their head on straight or move the child to another place of permanency. So this is number. these numbers are not going down. They're going up every year. So I'm calling Anna enough that I would like to think that one of the reasons they might be going up is because we're reporting more, because we see more, because we're more aware and we realize that we have a legal, ethical, moral responsibility to report suspected abuse. So you don't have to prove that a child is being abused, but if you suspect it, you legally are required in the state of Kentucky to report it. So that, I think that's really an important message to draw home to people as well, that because we go to church with people, our kids are in school with the people, our grandkids, you see people in Walmart, you know, and, and at Macy's that might need a little intervention. So we do have a duty to report that. So we can so we can prevent it. You keep these kids in the court. So how the court system works for a child is once they um, get the social service feels that it's important enough that the parents are not complying. But, and, and I have to say, in Davis County, in Kentucky, and in the United States, child abuse and neglect overwhelmingly is child neglect and overwhelmingly is because of substance abuse. So again, we connect right back to ORR and some of the other services. When, and now our substance abuse problems are escalating so high that parents are choosing their drugs over their children. And when they do that, that's when the kids suffer. So neglect is a form of child abuse. So when you see these kids that are, that are hungry, dirty, that kind of thing, although there's standards that allow them to be hungry and dirty, and to be poor is not abuse, but to withhold care for those children is. So there's a lot of variables in that that we watch for. So by the time, if a, if a case gets severe enough to go to court, it's bad. But the judge feels like, that, and now in Davis County, we have family court judge um, Julie Gordon. When she sees a case come in, her goal and the goal of the state is reunification of the family, if at all possible. That's, that's the goal. So when they get these cases in and you see that these parents have been neglectful or abusive to these kids, and you think, how could we want to drive them back home? No matter, and if you can remember your own childhood a little bit, no matter how badly you've been treated, you want mom and dad to love you. You want to be home. And a lot of these kids don't know what normal looks like, whatever definition of normal that we use. So the, the feel for the neglect or the whatever that they're, that's their normal, and they don't, they're not secure. So removing them from a traumatic situation is traumatic in itself. And then when they get removed, we've got, um, just as an example, we've got a little boy who is four. He has been in care since he was two. So and he has been in 24 placements. That means he's been living with total strangers 24 times. And he still gets to visit with his parent every now and then. But he doesn't have that kind of connection. He doesn't really trust people. So you think about the impact of that spiraling all the way up to an adult who then goes into substance abuse. Somehow we've got to figure out how we can break that cycle. And that's one of the reasons that we've been really working hard at Brandon and, and several of us have worked really hard to increase awareness in the community of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. So even though my biggest mission is it's my job is to be director of CASA, I think a life mission for all of us is to help figure out how we can look at everyone through that trauma lens so that we can impact the people that we touch every day. Because we look at people that have, if you, all of us have had some sort of childhood trauma, you can't survive it. But some of that trauma is enough that it actually changes the physio physiologic components of us, our DNA, it changes and they can prove that scientifically. So you think, um, well then, then, no wonder that people who have drug abuse have a higher incidence of lung cancer or you know, discomfort. But that's not what the connection is. Even if they didn't smoke, they still have a higher incidence of death. And it's because their DNA changes because of the trauma that they experience as a child. As they're developing, the body releases all those chemicals that do changes uh, slowly over time, microscopically. As a nurse, that scientific piece of that was really convincing to me that it's not just a, oh, 
for them. And we are not making excuses for bad behavior. We're saying if you look at someone, instead of saying, what is wrong with you, you say, what happened to you? If you look at someone that way, it changes your entire approach to them. And again, you're not excusing their behavior, but you're saying, how can we help break that cycle? How can we move forward from that? If you use that as your, as your, as your benchmark. Versus saying, you know, when you see a man come in to, to, recover, to um, jail from substance abuse, what happened in his life that no one made him feel special or no one, and maybe he had a wonderful life. Maybe those rare ones where they just kind of get off track. But overwhelmingly what we see in the prison population, incarcerated mothers and dads, is that they had some sort of child abuse and neglect in their lives as well. And I think all of us can look back on that. So there's a tremendous amount of information out there on the internet. Um, you can go to uh, acesconnection.com. Um, just Google the word adverse childhood experiences and you will find an incredible amount of information that you can share. There's some amazing videos, um, little short ones. Howard University did some great little studies and some little two minute videos that are very impactful. And then there's a, a, a pediatrician, Dr. Nadine Barcaris, who has made this her life goal to make people aware of adverse childhood experiences and her message is very powerful. So those are great to take to your board of directors and just let them watch that 12 minute video about how adverse childhood experiences affects every client that you touch, every person that you touch, every board member that you touch. It's really, really powerful. And the reason that that really affects what CASA does is because we use ACEs training and resiliency in everything that we do to help our advocates, our volunteers understand that it takes all the scientific studies prove it takes one caring adult to be the difference in the life of a, a, a child that's been abused. So we know that we break the cycle when we show one child that one person consistently cares about them, stands up for them, builds them up, doesn't walk away from them, and that's what CASA volunteers do. We, our volunteers are just incredible. They go, they go to court and tell the judge what they think is in the best interest of the child after they've made visitations with all the associated parties, the <coughs> attorneys, the social workers, the school <coughs> personnel, the families, that kind of thing, foster parents, they go back to them and they tell the judge, this is what we've seen, and even though Johnny says he wants to go home, we don't think it's safe for him to go home right now and we make a recommendation that he doesn't do that. So I think that that is where all of that ties in together, how CASA can impact the lives of the children because we know that they care and then they show the children that they care. So that I think that is how we all connect together as a community and how CASA is so powerful. So if you know any CASA volunteers, they're amazing. <coughs> if you know anyone who'd like to know more about the CASA opportunity, please get, let them get in touch with us. We, they typically use about 10 hours a month, um, and, and that includes the time that they see the child and make visits with the people associated with that. Rarely, um, the court going to court is maybe one every <coughs> six weeks because of the way the process works. So it's it's not a truly time intensive um, volunteer opportunity, but it is very unique. It's not making cookies. It's getting in, and there are almost many social workers because they really have to learn about the families and that kind of thing. So, but they come from all walks of life. Right now we have 54 active <coughs> volunteers serving 112 children in Davis County. They're from age 21 to 78. They come from all walks of life. We have men and women. We're just really, really proud of our volunteers. Our staff is incredible and they really build them up. And, and that's what they do is they support them, they help with the training, they go with them to visits and that kind of thing. So our staff is incredible. I have an amazing board of directors who've been very supportive of the efforts that we've made. And uh, one of our directors even came out this morning, Stacy Giles, and I appreciate her so much. And then our newest employee, Antoine uh, Smith Browse is here. And uh, so we're really grateful to have him. And then our mascot and uh, the, the director, the real director. <laughs> Watson. And, and the reason that we have Watson is that, again, studies have proven that having a therapy dog around a child that's been abused and neglect makes them feel safer when they're testifying, makes them feel um, get comforted and cared for. And adults in general, they, they reduce your heart rate, they make you feel, they just make you happy. And so he's like a big stuffed animal. He's 10 months old. He is a golden doodle. He is, um, he's a really special dog. He's got a great temperament and a uh, 
and overall, until a bird goes by, he's a perfect animal. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, I, I, I can't do anything without giving you a shout. There's some things on your on your table about what CASA is and what we do. And again, we are looking for volunteers. We have a training program starting actually next week, and we do those every quarter. And then um, some statistics about abuse and neglect in Kentucky and how ACASA makes a difference. And then a big shout out for our biggest fundraiser right now that you've seen. Uh, we'd like to invite you to not come to our event. And that's, that's, this is the first time we've done a no-show event. So by that, what we decided was we were tying up a lot of resources, staff and board time and money to put on an event at a facility and hire a band, pay for music and food and all that. And they kept walking away at the end of the day with about the same amount of money as we started with in sponsorship. So um, we decided to try this this year where the expense would be just mailing this out and really putting a lot of effort into making people aware of what we're doing and asking for donations. So while the event is imaginary, the need is very real and we, we really appreciate that. And, and we appreciate all of you supporting each other's organizations. I know Hospice had a great event this last weekend and um, it, we were proud to be there, proud to support them and the work that they do for our community. So I just want to thank you all. It's, it's, been, it's been amazing last couple of years and uh, we've got great things ahead for the community to come for sure.